Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Tom, I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. I'm Dr. Mahmoud Magdadi from Jordan Breast Cancer Program. Uh, I'm honored to welcome all of you to this session. I also want to say thank you for the great effort that you do. Today, we will have the second, uh, the fourth session, sorry, of the Jordan Breast Cancer in the, uh, Introductory Series to the Multidisciplinary Conference 2022, the Breast Imaging Series. This session will be about ultrasound of breast cysts that are not simple. I'm proudly welcoming our guest, uh, Dr. Tom Stavros. Dr. Stavros is a fellow of the ACR, the American College of Radiology, a fellow of the Society of Radiologists in Ultrasound, and an honorary fellow of the Royal Australian and the New Zealand College of Radiology. Dr. Stavros has authored the textbook uh, Breast Ultrasound and has lectured and taught extensively on breast ultrasound around the world. Dr. Stavros is a, uh, a board certified radiologist who has uh, a special interest in ultrasound breast imaging for more than 40 years. Welcome, Dr. Stavros. Good morning or good afternoon for you. Um, are you ready for me to begin? Yes, you can start at any time. Okay, let's see if I can make this smaller. Okay, so today we're going to talk about breast cysts that aren't simple. And we really worry more about these cysts than we should in most cases. There will be a few cases we see where a non-simple cyst is malignant, but the vast majority of cases are just part of what we call benign fibrocyst change or benign proliferative changes. And so what I'm hoping to do is give you a, a way of uh, looking at this that, um, you know, that helps you sort out what you're seeing and, and not worry as much. I'm going to show you a lot of pathology images, beautiful color pathology images. And then what I've learned is if you convert the color pathology to grayscale and you video invert it so that white becomes black and black becomes white, it looks very much like the ultrasound and it helps you understand what you're seeing on ultrasound. So I'm gonna show you many pathology images that have been converted to grayscale and video inverted. Now the percentage of cysts that is not simple has increased over the past few decades for two reasons. One reason is that we have better resolution. We scan with higher frequency, broader bandwidth, higher dynamic range, and we see real things, benign things that ex exist inside of benign fibrocystic change. The other thing we've done is we've pushed our scan parameters so far. We've taken our frequency too high and our bandwidth too wide and our net dynamic range too wide uh, that we're causing artifact inside of cysts. So there are some tricks we can use, technical tricks that we can use to minimize clutter artifact within cysts that make them appear not to be simple when in fact they really are simple. Now in the ACR Biorads ultrasound lexicon, we have complicated cysts, which are usually gonna be benign and usually Biorads two or three. These can be echoes within the fluid, diffuse low level echoes, scintillating echoes. I'll, I'll show examples of that. Fluid debris levels, which can be pus or just proteinaceous debris and fat fluid levels. These, these are usually part of the benign fibrocystic spectrum. But we also have what we now call complex cystic and solid masses, and those can be virids four or five, sometimes virids three, but they're, they're definitely more suspicious. They can just be due to apricot metaplation, but they can be due to papillomas or carcinoma. And these present as neural nodules, thick septations, thick walls, and internal vascularity. And there is still a small percentage of cysts where we just aren't sure whether they're uh, complicated cysts with echogenic fluid, that simulate the fibroadenoma or whether they're fibroadenoma. And we actually see these for biopsy sometimes. They get scheduled for a biopsy. We look at it, we say, really? I don't think that's solid. I think that's a complicated cyst. And so we aspirate it and cancel the biopsy. But there are a small percentage of cases where we can't tell whether it's cystic or solid. Now, on the right is what we're worried about. We worry about papilloma carcinoma being inside the cyst. But the left is what happens in fibrocystic change. And this is on the left is by far and away the most common things that cause echoes inside a cyst. Protein globs, 
cholesterol crystals, fat globules, white cells, red cells, epithelial cells, foamy macrophages, apocrine cells, and papillary apocrine metaplasia, which I've abbreviated as PAM. All of these things on the left are things that the pathologist can see, and he, will, he or she will describe them in the pathology report, in the body of the report, but what the pathologist has learned to do is not suffer brain damage from seeing all these things on the left. When the pathologist issues a, an impression or a summary, they just call this benign fibrocystic change. So most of what the remainder of this lecture about is about is how we as breast imagers can actually see these things inside of cysts and like our fellow colleague pathologists, we cannot worry about them. And we can just say, oh yeah, that's just part of benign fibrocystic change. So a lot of the talk is about how we distinguish things on the left from things on the right. Now, what is fibrocystic change? Okay, fibrocystic change starts at the level of the TDLU, the terminal ductal lobular unit. So I'm showing a normal TDLU on the left in long axis on the bottom and short axis on the top. So the, the top is taken at a 90 degree angle through the, the widest part of the lobule. ED stands for extra lobular terminal duct. Now, how many asini are there in a normal TDLU? On the average, 50 to 60. So in fibrocystic change, some or all of the asini become cystically dilated. So here I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cystically dilated asini. That's the cystic part of fibrocystic change. But also the normally gray loose stromal intralobular fibrous tissue becomes abnormally white. That's this part. And that's the fibro part of fibrocystic change. So in the long axis, we have the extralobular terminal duct that's a little dilated, has a little fluid in it. We have the intralobular terminal duct uh, again, a little dilated, a little fluid, and I see eight cystically dilated asini and abnormally white fibrous tissue, the fibro part of fibrocystic change. The, the, lot, the bottom is parallel to the long axis of the TDLU. The top is at 90 degrees orthogonal to the long axis. As the fibrocystic change becomes more severe, the asini become larger and fewer in number because the walls between the SNI either rupture or become effaced and incorporated into a larger, fewer number of SNI. And then finally, at the end, we can wind up with a tension cyst, which actually Blaslow has now shown on 3D slides, uh, occurs because of twisting of the extralobular terminal duct. So you can see right where this black arrow is, the extralobular terminal duct has twisted and has caused obstruction. And so what's happened here is all the asini have ruptured till there's only one single asini left. Now, on the left end, it's just normal anatomy. That's birids one. On the right end, that's birids two. That's a simple cyst. That's, you know, benign with 99.9% .9 certainty. But in the middle, where we have these partial involvement of fibrocystic change is where we can get confused. And this is a place where having higher quality ultrasound machines, a premium ultrasound machine, it doesn't matter which company makes it, there's a lot of companies that make good premium ultrasound machines, can give you an advantage because you can resolve the microcysts and separate them from the fibrous change. What I'm going to do is take Photoshop and I'm going to do a Gaussian blur, which would simulate scanning with a lower quality ultrasound machine. So in image B here, you can actually see individual microcysts with white fibrous tissue and say that's benign. But with a, with a lower end ultrasound machine, a less premium ultrasound machine, a cheaper, uh, less quality ultrasound machine, the white, the black cysts, microcysts, volume average with the white fibrous tissue and then create a fake pseudo mural nodule. And on the case on the right in image C, with a lower quality image, 
microcysts could be volume average with white fibrous tissue to create what looks like a thick septation. So in my experience, what you gain with a higher quality ultrasound machine is the ability to call to, to classify a larger percentage of these in between fibrocystic cases as benign. With a cheaper machine, it's harder to say that's not a mural nodule or that's not a thick septation. And so you have more false positives. I don't think you miss cancers with the cheaper machines, but it's harder to call benign fibrocystic cysts benign, more difficult. Now, one of the things that makes this difficult is that this is a single TDLU that I'm showing you. And this is an estrogen stain in brown. And you can see that there are small asini without estrogen receptors, and there are big cystically dilated asini with estrogen receptors. So what's going to happen in this case is we will be able to see the microcysts that have estrogen receptors, but this will look like a solid nodule or a mural nodule. And so if I show you the three-dimensional thick section images from Laszlo, and I, and I make them grayscale and video invert them, and then show you ultrasound pictures of the same thing, you can see how uneven distribution of estrogen receptors can create a falsely worrisome appearance to just garden variety fibrocystic change. And this is happening because of uneven distribution of estrogen receptors. So these larger microcysts that I'm seeing correspond to the asini that have estrogen receptors. The, the solid appearing parts are the parts where the asini are not dilated and they're below the resolution of the ultrasound machine. So this uneven distribution of estrogen receptors causes us difficulties in interpretation. Now, these are simple clustered macrocysts. In birads, they're birads too, they're just benign. But when we can see complex clustered macro or microcysts for several reasons. So this is a complex clustered microcyst, complex cystic and solid microcysts. What could cause that? Well, the first thing that could cause it is a lot of proteinaceous debris within the fluid because protein in the fluid is echogenic. And so it can falsely make this appear to be a microlobulated solid mass. Papillary apocrine metaplasia can cause a lot of echoes in these microcysts. So that's, that could also cause this appearance. We already showed you how uneven distribution of uh, estrogen receptors can lead to this appearance. And finally, micropapillary DAB or carcinoma in situ can cause this appearance. The reassuring thing is that about 99% of these complex cystic and solid microcysts are caused by one of the three benign etiologies. And only about one out of 100, or maybe even less, somewhere between one out of 100 and one out of 1,000 is actually caused by micropapillary carcinoma in situ. But I will show you a few examples of micropapillary carcinoma in situ, or uh, you know, is more like what a Laszlo would call it, micropapillary DAB uh, can cause this appearance. Now, these are pictures of fluids that were aspirated from benign breast cysts. And this is from a, a nice book on benign breast disease by Hughes and Manzel from uh, Scotland. Um, notice that the color varies tremendously. Now, what I'm gonna do is make these grayscale and video inverted. And what you can also see is that the opacity varies. So we have some medium opaque ones on the right, and so let's just say that medium opacity is caused by simple benign cysts. Well, these two in the pink box are more dense than simple cysts. What does that mean? That means there has to be something floating in the fluid that is denser than just water. So what is that? Well, it's not calcium, it's not that dense. So it's protein. So proteinaceous debris is contributing to this higher opacity. We also have two that are less opaque than average. 
So that, you know, something has to be floating in the fluid there. And it's not air because it's not as black as air would be, but it's fat. So what we're seeing is that out of these six cysts, two have proteinaceous debris and two have fatty debris floating within them. Now, what we're seeing here is opacity, not echogenicity, but you have to know that opacity is very similar to echogenicity. And so the reason for diffuse echoes in benign breast cysts is either protein or fat floating in the fluid. And that's very common. Now, do I believe that every single cyst, every single breast cyst contains either protein and or fat floating within the fluid? Absolutely, yes. Every single cyst does. But in the vast majority of cases, the protein and the fat are dilute. They're not concentrated. But they're so dilute, the cyst appears anechoic on ultrasound. The, the fat or the protein is simply not complicated enough. Now, luckily, about 80% of cysts are acute. They come and they go in a single menstrual cycle. But about 20% of cysts become chronic. And in a chronic cyst, what happens over a period of time is that the water can be resorbed through the cyst wall. And that means that over time, either the protein or the fat or both that are floating within the fluid become more concentrated. And we've seen this, you've all seen this. You follow up a cyst at six months or 12 months or 18 months, and the cyst becomes slightly smaller, but the fluid becomes more echogenic. It's a normal pattern. So this was a patient that we were following for a benign solid mass that we thought was a fibroadenoma, but she also had a cyst. So my sonographer just decided to take a picture of the cyst. This is the baseline exam. It's a simple cyst. When she came back for her six month follow-up, it was still a simple cyst and, and maybe a little bit bigger. But when she came back at a year, the cyst was smaller and now the fluid has developed echoes. So the, what we're seeing here is just what I described to you. I don't know whether this is fat or protein. I think it's probably fat but it's becoming more concentrated in this chronic cyst because the fluid is being resorbed through the wall, but the protein can't be, or the or fat can't be. So the protein and or fat is becoming more concentrated over time. So to give you an example of how BIRADS interacts with the histology, these are non-simple breast cysts, or these are cysts that every pathologist would call benign fibrocystic change in the impression of his histology report. These are the grayscale video inverted images, and these are the ultrasound images. So what we're seeing on the left is what I told you. Every cyst has some protein and or fat in it. So this has a little bit of proteinaceous debris with a thin wall. And the proteinaceous debris is so dilute that the cyst appears to be simple on ultrasound. So it's anechoic fluid with a thin, sharp, narrow, bright wall. The second cyst in has more concentrated proteinaceous debris. So that's causing diffuse low level echoes in the cyst, but we still have a thin, bright wall. The third cyst um, contains a single layer of apricot metaplasia. Now, apricot metaplasia releases fat into the cyst. So when you have apricot metaplasia, you will have fat, more fat than protein. So there is enough fat in this cyst that it's causing some echoes in the fluid. And the cyst wall is a little thicker and a little less white because the apricot cells are a little wider than the flat epithelium. Now, finally, on the right, we have papillary apricot metaplasia, which again is releasing fat in the cyst. So it has diffuse low level echoes, but notice that the wall is a little bit irregular. So in the BIRAD system, the cyst on the left would be simple. The two in the middle are complicated. And then the one on the right, because that is echogenic fluid and an irregular wall could be classified as either complicated or complex. But the way we classify things in BIRADS, we always classify it by the most suspicious thing that it could be. 
So since complex cystic and solid is more suspicious and complicated, the one on the right we would call complex. Now I mentioned that we can create artifacts in cyst by using too high a frequency, too wide a dynamic range, um, and uh, too, too wide a bandwidth. Now we can minimize the creation of fake or false non-simple cysts by understanding how to get rid of clutter artifact or volume averaging artifact within cysts. So one of the most important things you have to do is always make sure that your transmit focal zones are properly placed. So this is a BD sized palpable nodule that appears to be a microlobulated solid mass. But notice, notice where my focal zone is. It's, it's way in the wrong place. It's too, too deep. And it's just a single focal zone. I like to scan with at least three focal zones that are placed so that they cover the entire breast from the subcutaneous fat to the chest wall. Now, when I'm at a, a, a focal zone, so I have two focal zones instead of one, and I move them up to the proper level, I can now see that these are just clustered benign microcysts, which are bi reds too, and we don't have to worry about them. So this is an example of how properly using focal zones can minimize the chances of overdiagnosing non-simple cysts. Now there are true clutter artifacts that can appear in cysts. They could be reverberation or clutter, or all sorts of things, but harmonics and spatial compounding can help minimize that. So on the left is a fundamental image without harmonics. On the right is with harmonics. And you can see how much the harmonics cleans the artifact out of the cyst. In this particular case, uh, I have conventional ultrasound without spatial compounding on the left. And when I turn on the spatial compounding, I can get rid of the clutter artifact. Now, harmonics and spatial compounding work in different ways. So it's beneficial to have both on simultaneously. In the old days, only the top line machines could do one or the other. But today, even low end ultrasound machines and mid range ultrasound machines can do both spatial compounding and harmonics simultaneously. I believe so much in spatial compounding and harmonics that I have them permanently turned on in my breast imaging uh, pre scan presets. Do I ever have to turn them off? Sure, about 5% of the time I have to turn off um, uh, harmonics because I don't get adequate penetration. In, in a very large-breasted, dense-breasted woman, the penetration with harmonics may be inadequate, so I may have to turn it off. Uh, but using both can really minimize the number of fake non-simple cysts. Now, there are general rules for non-simple breast cysts, and they're very reassuring. But remember, general rules work in populations, not necessarily individual patients. So the, the reassuring general rules are that the majority of non-simple breast cysts are simply part of what we call benign fibrocystic change. Malignant non-simple breast cysts are not common. And when we do have a malignant breast cyst, it usually doesn't even look like a cyst. It looks like a solid mass that has undergone liquefactive or hemorrhagic central necrosis. It really is only in the rarest of circumstances that we're going to get a tricky or difficult to diagnose malignant non-simple breast cyst. But having said that, especially if you take care of doctors or nurses or doctor's wives, you know they're always the exception to the rule. So even though the general rules are very reassuring, it's important to have a, a, um, an algorithm that you use uh, compulsively in every case to make sure that the exceptions to the general rule do not slip through the cracks. Now, to develop this algorithm uh, was difficult. Why? Because the gold standard or the reference standard that we use for cysts is not as good as the reference standard we use for solid masses. 
the reference standard we use for solid masses is histology. It's not perfect, but it's a very good reference standard. The reference standard for cysts is either fluid cytology, which is terrible because it has too many false positives and too many false negatives, or short interval follow, which is terrible because 80% of the cysts go away and the patient never comes back. Um, and even when we did surgical excision of these lesions, it was difficult to get a correlation because invariably the dominant mammographically visible or palpable non-simple breast cyst was ruptured either by the surgeon or by the pathology staff when they prepared it. And a ruptured cyst may not be impressive to the pathologist. It may be misinterpreted as a background process. It really wasn't until my partner, Steve Parker, invented the ultrasound guided directional vacuum assisted biopsy device, the mammatome, that we were able to figure out exactly what caused cysts to appear non-simple and suspicious. And so really it was ultrasound guided DVAB that allowed us to develop the algorithm. Now the algorithm that we did develop is nothing unique. In English, we say we did not reinvent the wheel. The wheel was already reinvented. So what is the algorithm that we use? It's identical to the algorithm that I use for solid masses on ultrasound or for mammographic interpretation. I look for suspicious findings first, and if I find any, the whole lesion is suspicious and I have to biopsy it. If there are no suspicious features, I look for definitively benign features, which we would call birets too. If I can't find suspicious features and I can't find birets two features, then I can call it by reds three, but that's not my favorite strategy because there are too many cysts and I don't want to obstruct my entire breast imaging system following a lot of benign breast cysts. So, you know, my, my goals are number one and number two, and I really don't want to call it by reds three very often. That's the, a default position that I don't like to arrive at. Now, if we're going to look for suspicious findings first, what are they? Well, they're simply the things that in ACR BIREDS uh, lexicon uh, make a cyst uh, classified as complex cystic and solid rather than complicated. What are those things? Mural nodules, irregular wall thickenings, thick isochoic septations, internal blood flow, and then I would say certain complex clustered uh, microcysts. Now, Let's talk about septations and cysts. We shouldn't worry about thin septations. Um, this is a single TDLU in which I have three cysts. What is each cyst? Each cyst is an acinus that is cystically dilated. Now, out of plane, out of this thin tomographic ultrasound slice, there may be a few other acini, but in the, in the Thin tomographic slice here, I have three residual acini. What is the thin, sept thin septation? It's simply the unruptured wall of the acinus. So here's what would correspond to clustered simple microcysts. If I make a grayscale and video invert it, you can see that the thin white lines correspond to the unruptured wall of an acinus. So if I want, I can think of this as a cluster of simple cysts. And if each cyst, each of the individual cysts is benign, then the whole cluster of cysts is benign. So what this means is that thin, bright white, hyperechoic septations are not suspicious, they're benign. On the right is a thick isochoic septation. Could that represent something benign? Sure. It could represent a benign papilloma. It could represent apricot metaplasia. It could represent fibrosclerosis. Those are benign. But it could be DCIS or invasive malignancy inside the cyst. But the odds are different. The chances of malignancy on the left are way under 1%, more like one in a thousand. The chances on the right might be five or 6%. It's not 95%, it's not even 50%. But the odds are different enough that I can't call this benign. I have to be worried about a thick isoprocetation. Now, it's important to know that most complex cystic and solid masses are not papillomas or carcinoma. Most of them are apricot metaplasia, which is part of the benign fibrocystic spectrum. And if we biopsy every single non-simple 
cyst or every complex cystic and solid mass, we're going to get a lot of false positives. So it would be helpful to think about how we might be able to distinguish a complex cystic and solid mass caused by apocrine metaplasia, which is benign, from one that is caused by either papilloma or carcinoma. And to do that, we come back to the chicken versus the egg argument. Which came first? Did the papillary lesion come first? Or did the cyst come first? Well, I think it makes sense that the papillary lesion comes first. And then by two mechanisms, it secondarily creates the cyst. So what are the two mechanisms that secondarily create the cyst? Number one, the papillary lesion secretes fluid. Number two, it obstructs the draining duct so that the fluid can't get out. So if those two things happen, the papilloma secondarily creates the cyst. But if we think of it that way, then we have some clues about how to figure out what happened. So what I've drawn here is a complex cystic and solid nodule where the cyst is formed secondarily to a papillary lesion. So what are the features that are gonna help me distinguish papilloma from a papillary lesion? All right, so I can't really evaluate the internal surface area for shape or um, surface characteristics because what determines shape and surface characteristics is aggressiveness of growth and resistance to growth by the surrounding tissues. But if you think about it, when something is growing inside of water, there's zero resistance to growth in any direction. So what that means is this entire surface of the lesion that's surrounded by fluid is going to be identical in shape and surface characteristics for both benign and malignant lesions. There's nothing along this pink area that's going to help me tell benign from malignant. The only place where there's going to be a difference between benign and malignant is over on this right wall where the papillary lesion arose and where there are gonna be a couple things happening. So the first thing that happens is that the thin echogenic wall of the cyst will be absent. So notice that I have absence of the thin echogenic capsule. And the second thing that happens is the papillary lesion, whether it's DCIS or invasive cancer or papilloma, will grow up the duct toward the nipple a certain distance and it may involve other ducts. So what I wanna do is confine my attention to this part of the lesion where it appears to be attached to the wall because that's where the answer is that helps me distinguish just benign fibrocystic change with apical metaplasia from a papilloma carcinoma. And so what are the findings along that point of attachment? Well, I will have loss of the capsule I will have either irregular angular margins or protrusion beyond the wall in what I would call a duct extension or an enlarged duct, and maybe a fibrovascular stall. So here's a lesion that's about, it's a complex cystic and solid lesion. About 75% is filled with solid material, but notice that the thin echogenic wall is intact all along the left side. There's no absence of the capsule. That favors apical metaplasia. That's reassuring. This lesion, the capsule is absent where the mural nodule appears to be attached and there's irregularity there. So I have two findings suspicious, absence of the capsule, irregularity. This is a hemorrhagic intracystic papilloma. The one on the left is just papillary apricot metaplasia. Another thing we can look at is shape. Apricot metaplasia is not gonna extend beyond a round or oval shape because it's developing inside an asinus. And so again, here's a complex cystic and solid mass, but it's a perfect oval shape and it has an intact capsule all along the point of attachment. That's reassuring, that's apocrine metaplasia. On the right, I have an extension beyond an oval or a round shape as the papillary lesion grows up the duct toward the nipple. So this is a keyhole shape. So the keyhole shape represents the duct extension growing out of the lesion. And here's a, here's a real lesion, here's a papillary lesion. You can see the oval shape, and you can see that there's a duct extension growing out. So this is the, this is the histologic explanation of the keyhole shape. Now, 
what do I have here? I have a complex cystic and solid lesion, mass with microcalcations. I have an intact thin wall along the right side, but it's absent on the left. And I've got stuff outside. Now, what I want you to notice is that there's much more outside than there is inside. And when that happens, you really need to think about DCIS. This is grade three DCIS that did create a complex cyst, but much of the lesion is outside the cyst. And notice that it has the classical low power histologic appearance or subgross histologic appearance of grade three DCIS. Each microlobule is in a large duct. And in the center of those is the necrosis, and in the center of the necrosis is the microcalcation. So this is classical ultrasound for grade three DCIS. Here's another one. Capsule is absent along the left side, and there are large ducts without calcifications extending the surrounding tissue. But again, there's more of the lesion outside than there is in. Now, these enlarged ducts in the surrounding tissue uh, have a pretty pretty high positive predictor value. I mean, so when I look at a complex cyst, there's maybe a <clears throat> one to 5% chance that it's malignant. But if I see these enlarged ducts without calcifications, uh, it's 40%. So that's high BIRADS 4B. If they have cent uh, central calcifications, as, as we see on the left, that's almost BIRADS 5. That's high BIRADS 4C, 93% positive predictor value. So these are strong predictors. And so the moral of the story I'm giving you is that in these cases, many times, most of the lesion is outside the list. So don't just examine what's inside the cyst and this little point at which it's attached, but carefully look in the surrounding tissue uh, for abnormally enlarged ducts. And if I take away the highlighting, you can see that there are normal ducts here, 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 here. I can see five normal ducts, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, you know, I can see a dozen normal ducts here. And notice that each of these microlobulations is six or eight or 10 times the size of normal ducts. This is not subtle. But if you, you know, if you focus too much on the cyst, you miss the key stuff that's going on or in the surrounding tissues. Now, one thing about papillary apical metaplasia, it's just two cells wide. It does not develop a fibrovascular stalk. All of the nutrients come into the apricot metaplasia and all the wastes leave the apricot metaplasia by passive diffusion through the fluid. So we rarely, rarely see a fibrovascular stalk if the solid component in a non-simple cyst is caused by apricot metaplasia. Do we ever get um, blood flow with apricot metaplasia? We can if there's secondary inflammation, and we can if the apricot metaplasia developed on the surface of a pre-existing papilloma, but that's unusual. In general, if we see intra, if we see blood vessels inside a mural nodule or an eccentrically thickened wall or a thick septation, that's going to be papilloma carcinoma. So that's a very strong positive predictor. So here's a papillary lesion with a branching fibrovascular stalk. That's a papilloma. That there's no way that's going to be just apricot metaplasia. This is apricot metaplasia filling about two thirds of a cyst, and there is no blood flow there, no 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 blood flow. And I can prove that that's not just a fat fluid level uh, by showing that it doesn't shift after five or ten minutes change in position. Now I mentioned that you really can't tell benign or malignant by evaluating the part of the lesion that interfaces with fluid because benign and malignant lesions have the same shapes and surface characteristics because there's zero resistance to growth when you're surrounded by fluid. But when there is invasion, when there's an invasive malignancy inside a cyst, the cancer can't invade the fluid. Where does it invade? It invades inwardly into the fibrovascular stalk. And if it invades inwardly into the fibrovascular stalk and it generates neovascularity, where's the neovascularity going to be? In the vascular stalk. So in general, benign papillomas are fed by a single vessel that may branch, but malignant lesions can generate multiple feeding vessels coming in. So that can be helpful. I wouldn't trust the negative predictive value of that, but if you see multiple feeding vessels coming in at a 90 degree angle to the, to the orientation to a wall, 
that's suspicious for malignancy. Now, I did mention that about one out of, somewhere between one and 100 and one out of 1,000 of these complex cystic and solid microcysts can be caused by um, micropapillary DCIS. And it can simulate uh, clustered microcysts caused by apical metaplasia. So these are beautiful 3D thick section slides by Laszlo Tavar. Color, grayscale video inverted. Hmm, not too reassuring. They look very similar. Uh, I do want to point out that these are asini, these are ducts. So even though they look similar, this is a cluster of neoducts, this is a cluster of asini with apical metaplasia. But you can see on ultrasound, they can be very similar in appearance too. So what can we do to make a distinction? Well, there, there's not much we can do with grayscale, but this is where Doppler can help. This is an example of complex clustered microcysts that were scanned by my partner. And my partner said it's probably fibrocystic change, come back in six months. The patient thought that in seven weeks it enlarged. So she came back and sure enough, it had enlarged from 14 millimeters to 33 millimeters. So it was growing very rapidly. And by the time she came back for surgery, she didn't really need a needle look because it became palpable, but it, was, it went from 14 millimeters to 50 millimeters in size in 10 weeks. This is grade three micropapillary DAB. Now what my partner didn't do on the first exam and what we should have done is turned on colored Doppler because when I did the second exam, you can see how tremendously vascular this is. Now remember, what is my differential diagnosis for complex clustered microcyst? Apricot metaplasia versus micropapillary DAB. Apricot metaplasia virtually ne never develops internal blood flow. Micropapillary DAB grade three is one of the most vascular lesions of the breast. So when I see all that internal vascularity, that strongly favors this being micropapillary DAB. So by not turning on the Doppler, we lost one of the useful things that we might have done to tell between apricot metaplasia and the DAB. Now, I will say that you have to scan very lightly. So you have to take your probe and you hold it between your thumb and your index and middle finger, and you take most of the weight on your hypothenar eminence and you want to scan very lightly so that you're not compressing the breast. Here, my sonographer label, I was scanning, the sonographer labeled this firm compression. That wasn't firm compression. I was just letting the weight of my arm rest on the transducer. And that was enough to create a false negative Doppler. But when I actually physically lifted up on the probe like I showed you so that, you know, I barely was touching the skin, you can see that virtually the entire thing is filled with vessels. So you want to scan very, very lightly. The transducer is hard, the chest wall is hard. There's no muscle or elastic in neovessels. And so it's very easy to compress them. If you wanna, if you wanna not get false negatives, you have to scan where you're barely touching the skin without compression. Now, in apricot metaplasia clustered microcyst, do you ever see blood vessels? Sure. This is just a blood vessel passing by. And if you do a video sweep, you can see that this has nothing to do with the lesion. It's just a normal breast vessel that's passing by a clustered microcyst, which is different from a lot of polymorphic, uh, disorganized internal vessels that we see on the right micropathway. Now, I did mention that occasionally you can get false positive clustered microcysts because of secondary inflammation. The fat that the apocrine cells release is inflammatory. And so if a small tear or rent forms in the epithelial lining of clustered microcysts and this fatty fluid comes in contact with the surrounding tissue, it can cause intense inflammation. So I participated in the Akron 6666 study. And this was something I called benign clustered microcysts. I just gave it by reds too. I didn't even measure it or mention it in the report. I just called the report by reds too. But five weeks later, she came back and she had some redness and tenderness over the lesion. And you can see that the fat in front of the cyst is abnormally white. It's, a, it's edematous. And you can see that the walls of the cyst are a little thicker and a little grayer and a little less well-defined. And now she's developed a lot of secondary hyperemia. So this is a false positive Doppler in, in clustered microcysts caused by apricot metaplasia due to secondary inflammation, but it's not common. And you'll have a few cases of false positives. 
Now, once we decide that there's that the lesion is suspicious for papilloma or carcinoma, um, fluid cytology is not good enough. And in fact, it's almost contraindicated because if you if you do get suspicious cytology, once you draw the fluid out, you may not be able to find the lesion to go back and localize it for surgical excision or for for core biopsy. So I want histology and I want specifically a directional vacuum assisted biopsy. I don't think core biopsy is the right thing to do here because these are very friable lesions and the cyst decompresses after the first shot. And there's usually a lot of bleeding with them. And so the pathologist is not gonna be happy with the histology for core biopsy. He's gonna be much happier uh, with the uh, histology from a vacuum biopsy. And in, in this case, I particularly try to target the vascular stalk because the only place that these lesions are attached is at the vascular stalk. So if you get the vascular stalk, the whole lesion just comes right out. So I put the probe in deep to the lesion and I take the lesion out and then I always deploy a marker in case there's um, uh, atypia or malignancy. We have to go back and resect the area. Now, there's one thing besides papilloma carcinoma that we might intervene on, and that's when we thought there was an infected cyst. So there's three signs of inflammation or infection that we can see in a cyst. Uniform iso quote, quote unquote wall thickening, a debris level which represents pus, white cells, and hyperemia of the cyst wall. And again, a cyst wall I put in quotes because the hyperemia in the, in the thickening is actually pericystic, not in, in the cyst wall. So on the right is what a benign breast cyst looks like, thin hyperechoic wall. On the left is what an inflamed cyst looks like. It's fairly uniform isochoic wall thickening with a debris level. And the debris level here is pus. It's layered white cells. And the wall thickening in most cases is due to a combination of uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells and foamy macrophages, but especially when there's fat in these cysts, uh, foamy macrophages contribute tremendously to the, to the wall thickening. Again, in a benign cyst on the right, we don't see any blood flow in a cyst wall, but we get a tremendous amount of pericystic hyperemia. Again, this looks like it's parallel to the cyst wall, but it's actually in the pericystic tissues that the inflammation is occurring. Now, we can tell something from the orientation of the vessel. I showed you that the vascular stalk in papillary lesions tends to be oriented perpendicular to the cyst wall because it's merely passing through the wall to supply the intracystic papillary lesion. On the other hand, when a cyst is inflamed, the vessel is oriented parallel to the cyst wall because it's supplying the pericystic inflammation. So the orientation of the vessel can help us tell an inflamed cyst on the left from an intracystic, from blood flow that's supplying an intracystic papillary lesion on the right. I've seen only two cases of, of malignancies that had long segments of vessels parallel to the wall. This was a, a grade three triple negative um, uh, medullary cancer that had extensive hemorrhagic internal necrosis. So the only blood vessels left were in the non-necrotic part outwardly. Now I did show you that cyst before that became more concentrated over time and developed echo. So again, this is the baseline, simple. This is the six month follow-up, a little bigger and still simple. This is the one year follow-up um, where the wall has now become thickened and there's low level echoes. And then 12 months later, there was acute inflammation. Now we got a pus layer, we got uniform isocoic wall thickening, and we got hyperemia. So what happened here? The cyst originally had fat. And when the cyst became chronic, the fat concentrated over time. And then eventually, sometime between a year and two years, she developed a tear in the wall of the cyst and the fat came in contact with surrounding tissue and caused a, a sterile or bland mastitis, uh, chemical mastitis due to the, the fat. Now, when I aspirate this, the fluid aspirates completely. The two walls of the cyst are touching, but I have some residual wall thickening, which represents two opposed layers of these foamy macrophages. And what I followed many of these, dozens of these, over a period of two weeks, two to three weeks, and invariably this uh, thickening resolves. So I now know that 
having residual pericystic wall thickening after your aspirated inflamed cyst is normal. Now notice the, the vascularity here. If I, if I go back and show you the cyst before I've aspirated, if I come in through this wall, I'm gonna get bloody fluid. If I come in through this wall, I've got a, you know, a less chance of getting bloody fluid. So when I aspirate these inflamed cysts, I'm either going to get uh, bloody pus or, or, or non-bloody pus. And using ultrasound guidance can help me minimize the chances of getting bloody pus. There's no point in getting, if I just get pus, there's no point in getting cytology or flow cytometry from the pathologist. All I'm worried about is gram stain and culture. Is this bland chemical mastitis or is this infectious? mastitis. And so all I care about is the gram stain in the culture. But if I get bloody pus, then I have to run cytology, which is kind of a waste of time. Now, there is a, a, um, a thick-walled fiber cyst that looks very much like an inflamed cyst, because why? It's the healed phase. So every thick-walled fiber cyst was at one time acutely inflamed, but it's healed with a thick fibrous wall but it's not tender, it generally doesn't have pus, doesn't have a fluid layer, and it no longer has hyperemia. So these you can call just benign. Now the pus in these cysts can be very viscous. Uh, so here the pus is layered posteriorly when the patient is supine, lying on her back. But if I put her left lateral to cube at two minutes, the pus is only beginning to shift. At three minutes, a little more, and it isn't until five minutes that it shifted. So the pus, can shift very slowly. If you want to change the pace and position left to left lateral decubitus while you're scanning transversely or upright while you're scanning longitudinally, you may have to wait five minutes for it to shift. There is a shortcut that can help you. Does this appear to be a mural nodule? It does. But is it? No, it's not. It's tumefactive pus in an inflamed cyst. Now, what I can use to avoid waiting five minutes is power Doppler vocal fremitus. So if I use Fremitus with a solid orange or solid yellow map, which we talked about Sunday when we're looking for multifocal disease, and I have the patient hum in a deep voice, the breast vibrates and it creates artifact. Now, if this were a true mural nodule, it would be attached to the wall. If it were attached to the wall, it would turn orange. It would vibrate just like the surrounding tissue. Because this does not vibrate, and because this does not turn orange or yellow, then I know for sure it's not attached. And I don't have to wait the five or 10 minutes for this to shift. Well, in this particular case, it was so viscous, it took 10 minutes to shift. But you can see clearly, this is tumefactive pus. But I saved 10 minutes. I could have saved 10 minutes simply by using power Doppler vocal fremitus to prove that it's not attached. Uh, this is a hemorrhagic papilloma. And this part is hemorrhage, and the part on the left is the papilloma. How do I know? The papilloma is attached to the wall. It vibrates and turns orange. The hemorrhage is not attached to the wall, does it? So this can help me target. I mean, when I look at this lesion, it may be hard for me to know what I want to target from a biopsy. But now I know that I need to target the part that's turning orange. Again, this just shows pus or bloody pus. And again, it shows the advantage of using color or power Doppler to guide your biopsy. Because if I avoid the blood vessels, I get what I, I just get pus. And then I only need a gram stain in the culture. If I can't avoid the vessels and I get bloody pus, then I'm forced to get a gram stain in culture and cytology and flow cytometry, which I don't want to get because I'm not worried about tumor. I'm only worried about infection versus bland inflammation. Now, once we decide that cyst is not suspicious for cancer and it's not infected, uh, then I can look for definitively benign findings. And most of these are just what make a cyst um, complicated rather than complex cystic and solid and virids. These are scintillating echoes. These are just cholesterol crystals that are being moved by the acoustic radiation force of the ultrasound machine. Now, most machines boot up at low power because of Alara as low as reasonably acceptable regulations. And at the default low power ultrasound settings, there may not be enough energy to move these. So if you wanna move them with grayscale, 
you may have to manually turn up your transmit power. I think a better way is simply to turn on color or power Doppler because color or power Doppler uses about 10 times the acoustic radiation force of grayscale ultrasound. You can see how much faster these are moving. This is creating color streaming or color streaking. It's been called different things. I just call them scintillating echoes. Uh, but you can see that the color uh, is moving in faster than the grayscale. Now, this is a case where I tried to turn up the power in grayscale. It looks like maybe there's a complex cystic and solid mass with a mural module. But when I turn on color Doppler, I can see that there's absolutely no uh, solid mural module. These are just echoes that could not be moved by the grayscale energy because the fluid was too viscous. So you're seeing an advantage to Doppler. Doppler will move echoes uh, in more viscous fluid than more old sound. Now, here I'm showing an open color box on the left. And I'm showing what happens when I narrow the color box on the right. Notice how much more focused the energy is. So if I narrow my color box, uh, the acoustic radiation force is greater and I can move fluid that I can't move with an open box. And then finally, shear wave supplies even more energy than color. So I can see both from the fact that there's no shear wave transmitted and also I can see the particles moving on the grayscale image below. Um, and so there's a spectrum of viscosity the least viscous fluid, you can move the echoes with just grayscale with the power turned up. Uh, if the fluid's more viscous, you're going to have to use an open color box. If the fluid's more viscous, you may have to use a narrow color box. And if the fluid is very viscous, you may only be able to move it with shear wave. So if you have a choice and you want to, you know, just do one test, probably a shear wave will be your best chance of, of creating scintillating echoes in the highest percentage of cases. Now, when you aspirate these, cysts that contain scintillating echoes, you, you get negative cytology, negative flow cytometry. But if you look under polarized light, you see these birefringent crystals that represent cholesterol crystals. So we think that the scintillating echoes are just cholesterol crystals and are simply part of the benign fibrocystic spectrum. Now we can see fat fluid levels in cysts far more commonly in ultrasound than we do in mammography. In mammography, we generally see them only in classical galactoseals. But in ultrasound, we see these thousands of times a year. And the fluid, the fat is echogenic, and it goes to the non-dependent part of the cyst. So when the patient's supine, it, it floats anteriorly. When she's upright, it goes to the craniate end of the cyst. Or if she's left lateral cube and you're standing transversely, it goes to the, to the right side of the cyst. Notice that this looks like the cap on an acorn. So I call these acorn cysts. Notice that they aspirate completely. So the fat will come out through the needle. And I won't initially see a fat level here. So this is immediately after aspiration because the fat becomes emulsified when it comes through the tiny aspiration needle. But if I let this set upright on the disc for about an hour, a little white fat layer forms on the top of it. Now there is another entity that can cause quote unquote acorn cyst, and this is apricot metaplasia, but it's firmly attached all along the left side. So no matter how long I wait, this will never shift. So this is apricot metaplasia, the other cause of uh, acorn cysts. Now, just like the debris levels in infected or inflamed cysts are very viscous and shift very slowly, the same is true for fat fluid levels. So here I've got fat filling the upper three quarters of the cyst when I'm scanning longitudinally with a patient upright. When I put her flat on her back, immediately, nothing happens. At one minute, it's beginning to shift, two minutes a little more, three minutes a little more, but it took five minutes for this flat fat layer to redistribute to the new non-dependent position. This is more problematic than debris levels. We will probably see 10 fat levels, lipid layers, for every single debris level we see. And in some patients with um, pretty severe fibrocystic change, you might see five or 10 of these on each side. If you had to wait five minutes in each one of these to determine whether this was just a fat fluid level, it would take you 100 minutes to scan just these 10 uh, breast cysts. So 
are there shortcuts we can use? Well, we talked about fermentus, and I'll show you fermentus and fat food levels. But another thing you can use is the shape and orientation of the interface. Because of surface tension, when a fat fluid level is transitioning from one non-dependent position to another, it's obliquely oriented with respect to the desk or the, or the floor, and it's convex posteriorly and concave anteriorly, convex posteriorly, concave anteriorly. All these are fat fluid levels in the process of transitioning, and they're all obliquely oriented, and they're all convex posteriorly, concave anteriorly. Now, this is two acorn cysts side by side. I mentioned that the differential diagnosis for acorn cysts is fat fluid level versus apricot metaplasia. Apricot metaplasia is attached. Fat fluid level is not. So fat fluid level will not turn orange, but apricot will. So you can see that the, the acorn cyst on the right, the echogenic part is turning orange. That means that's apricot metaplasia. So that's a complex cystic and solid mass. The one on the left, the echogenic part is not turning orange. So that's not attached. That's a BioEDS 2 um, fat fluid level. Calcifications uh, can also be considered um, complicated. So you can have milk with calcium, or you can have calcium oxalate crystals. Those are the two kinds of calcifications you see in benign fibrocystic change. The samomatous calcifications in milk of calcium are too small to see individually on ultrasound. What we see is a layer of white that represents clusters of dozens of samomatous calcifications. And if I put the patient upright, they will shift to the dependent part of the cyst. And this is perfectly analogous to creating a teacup on horizontal beam mammogram. So this is the ultrasound counterpart of the teacup sign. Now, there are larger calcifications that have occurred fibrocystic change called calcium oxalate crystals, also called wedolites, that look more like gallstones. They're a little bigger. So in the supine position there on the posterior wall, when I put her left lateral decubitus, they fall over the left side. You can actually see them tumble in real time. So here I'm turning a patient from her back to her left side. And you can see this calcium oxalate crystal falling. That's part of the benign fibrocystic spectrum. These are bipyramidal in shape, square in shape. And since our digital imaging uses square voxels, these show up very well on, on digital imaging. Now, you can have mixtures of milk of calcium and calcium oxalate crystals. So the sheet of white that we're seeing here it, are dozens of, of these tiny salmomatous calcifications, but I can see two discrete larger calcifications that represent uh, the calcium oxalate crystals. So here I'm getting a mixture of both. Now generally you can see more numerous and smaller calcifications on the mammogram than an ultrasound, but the mammogram is very nonspecific. This is by reds four mammograms can require stereo biopsy, but if I do a video sweep through it on ultrasound, I can see that these are clustered microcysts, and in the bottom of each microcyst is either calcium oxalate crystal or milk of calcium or some combination thereof. So in this particular case, even though the spatial resolution of ultrasound is maybe 200 to 500 microns, whereas it's 70 to 100 microns with mammography, even though I can see more numerous calcifications, and generally I can characterize them better on mammography than ultrasound, in this particular case of clustered microcysts with milk of calcium, I might be able to be more specific with the ultrasound. Any uh, cyst that arises from the skin is benign. It can be entirely within the skin. It can be mostly subcutaneous with a claw sign of skin wrapping around it, or it can be entirely subcutaneous with a hair follicle or gland neck that it drains, maybe even a whitehead or a blackhead. Those are benign. Notice that I've had to use a gel standoff in every case. This is the ultimate near field uh, application. Notice also that to show the hair follicle, these are, these are coarse obliquely through the skin. So your, your gel standoff usually needs to be a little asymmetric. You need to create a little obliquity uh, to try to get as close to 90 degrees to the angle of incidence to the hair follicle into which it drains as possible. Now, I, I mentioned the 3% cases that are indeterminate cystic versus solid. In general, fibroadenomas are oval shaped, isoco can have normal sound drive admission. In general, complicated cysts are rounder, darker, and have more enhanced through transmission. But that's just a general rule. There, you know, this on the left could be a complicated cyst, and on the right, it could be a fibroadenoma. So in an individual case, the general rules don't help you much. So 
you have to have strategies. So we talked about clearing internal artifact by moving your focal zones right using harmonics and spatial compounding. I won't dwell on that again. We can look for internal blood vessels. We can assume it's solid and characterize it. We can look at elastography. We can attempt to aspirate, or we can do ultrasound guided DFAD. And I'll go through these one at a time. This could have been um, a complicated cyst or a solid mass or an encysted papilloma. When we turned on color Doppler, there are numerous uh, feeding vessels. So this was either solid or an encysted papilloma. We knew that this was not just a complicated cyst. Um, here I'm using elastography. No matter how viscous the fluid, uh, shear waves will not transmit through uh, uh, echogenic fluid. So the fact that I've got black in the center proves that this is a complicated cyst. The fact that this turns blue indicates that it's solid. So by using shear wave, I can tell solid from complicated cyst with echogenic fluid. Uh, now with strain elastography, it's going to vary from machine to machine. Um, this is one of the large companies. They, they look for this trilaminar appearance of um, three layers of blue, red, and green to tell cyst from solid. And on some of the other uh, machines that use grayscale um, elastography, strain elastography, they look for a targetoid or bullseye appearance uh, to correspond to cysts. So there, there are various different ways you can use elastography to tell a complicated cyst uh, from a solid mass. If you're still not sure, uh, one thing you could do is say, well, what's the worst it could be? The worst it could be a solid. So if you characterize these, they almost always characterize as, as BIRADS3 benign. They're oval around, have a thin capsule and normal, normal or enhanced sound transmission. Um, if you want to aspirate it, that's not one of my favorite strategies because if it doesn't aspirate completely, you're obligating yourself to go on to vacuum biopsy. But I haven't found any way to predict whether these will aspirate from the grayscale appearance. It might be completely non-aspiratable, it might be partially aspiratable, or it might be completely aspiratable. I just can't tell. What could this be? It could be a fibroadenoma. It could be a papilloma completely filling a cyst. It could be a cyst just with proteinaceous debris or just fatty debris. Or it could be completely filled with apricot metaplasia. Or it could be partially filled with apricot metaplasia and partially filled with flat. It could be six different things, and I don't know. This is proteinaceous fluid, this is fatty fluid, and this is completely filled with apricot metaplasia, but I can't tell. This looks like a fibroadenoma, but it aspirated completely. Now, this actually occurs fairly commonly. Why does it occur? Because the amount of fluid in these complicated cysts varies with the menstrual cycle. So say you're in a group with uh, at least one other breast imager, and your partner sees this during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle when there's not much fluid in it. Well, when your partner looked at it, it looked solid. So he scheduled it for biopsy. Then she shows up the day of the biopsy and you're gonna do the biopsy and you look at it and you say, really? That looks more like a complicated cyst to me because it's bigger and has more fluid because you're seeing her in the post-ovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle when it's accumulated more fluid. So it doesn't necessarily mean your partner is a bad radiologist. The amount of echogenicity and fluid within this varies with the menstrual cycle. But I, I cancel a lot of biopsies this way. You know, She comes in for core biopsy or vacuum biopsy, and I say, I don't think so. I'm going to aspirate this. And if it aspirates completely, I'm going to cancel the biopsy. Now, if it doesn't aspirate completely, you have another choice. So here, this looks like a cyst. My tip of my needle is exactly halfway between the front and the back wall, but I can't ask, it won't aspirate at all. So what I can do is rock the needle. If I rock the tip of the needle posteriorly, the tip of the needle stays exactly fixed, halfway between the front and posterior capsules. And I mean, I'm rocking it with a lot of pressure. Notice that my pressure is so great, it's indenting the pectoralis muscle. So this proves unequivocally that this mass is solid. And then I can go ahead and core biopsy or do that FNA if that, that's what you want to do. Now, here's a case where I've rocked the tip of the needle anteriorly and I've rocked the tip of the needle posteriorly. What does this mean? Well, it meant the fluid was too thick to aspirate, too viscous to come through the needle. And maybe it's just fluid, 
or maybe it's apric and metaplasia, or maybe it's a combination of fluid and apric and metaplasia. So, you know, one thing I could do is go back, if this was a 20 gauge needle, I could go back and try to aspirate it with an 18 gauge needle. But by rocking the tip of the needle inside it, I can break some apricot snouts loose. And then when I stain this, I can turn a failed F, uh, aspiration into an FNA. And I can either get acellular debris or I can get apricot snouts that tell me that this was apricot metaplasia within the cyst. So simply by rocking the tip of the needle within the cyst, I can gain additional information. This is why I don't like aspiration as my first approach. Here's a lesion. It partially aspirated, but because it didn't completely aspirate, I was obligated to go on and perform vacuum assisted biopsy. And I, I don't like to have to go on and be aggressive with fibrocystic change if I can avoid it. Now, if I can't call it BIRADS two or three, then I have to go back to calling it 4A and biopsy it. We do need to use the rule of multiplicity and the indication for what we do, why we were doing the ultrasound is important. This is a single field of view in a patient in whom every single field of view looked this way. There's a cyst with a debris level. There's a cyst with a fat level. There's a cyst with papillary African metaplasia. So these are acorn cysts two and three. And there's an indeterminate cyst of first solid. Every field of view looked that way. So if the indication is screening and I'm seeing multiple cysts on both sides. I'm generally gonna use the rule of multiplicity to call these birads too. But if one of these was the only cyst I saw and it was palpable or mam a dominant mammographic, make, making a dominant mammographic mass, I would have to call it birads three or four biopsy. So you have to know what the indication is um, for using the rule of multiplicity. So in summary, a lot of benign cysts appear to be not simple. Most non-simple appearing cysts are part of the benign fibrocystic spectrum. Harmonics and spatial compounding are very useful in distinguishing pseudo non-simple cysts from real non-simple cysts. Suspicious findings are those that make a cyst complex, mixed cystic and solid in the BIRADS category, whereas reassuring cysts are those that are complicated in the BIRADS series. And there's lots of technical tricks we can use to prove definitively benign things, including Doppler, acoustic radiation force to create scintillating echoes or color streaking or color streaming, position change, power Doppler, vocal fremitus, elastography, or even manipulation of the needle inside the lesion when we fail to aspirate it. And it's also important to recognize that we need to use the rule of multiplicity. Uh, Non-simple cysts are so common uh, Benign non-simple cysts are so common that we don't want to completely obstruct our breast care system biopsying or following up something that's almost certainly to be benign. Thank you. Hello? Uh-oh. Are you still there? Yes, Dr. Ria. Oh, good. I thought I lost you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Tom. Okay, uh, guys, please, if anyone has a question, you can use the Q&A option or raise hand option if you want to speak. Dr. Tom, I think we have one question already. It's about okay. explaining uh, chemical mastitis. Ah, okay. Yes, it's just please exp explain the chemical mastitis. Okay. Most breast cysts are caused by apricot metaplasia. Apricot metaplastic cells excrete fat into the cyst fluid. If a cyst becomes chronic, the fat becomes more concentrated. And that fat is highly inflammatory. So in a chronic cyst or clustered microcysts, if a tear or discontinuity forms in the cyst wall and that fatty 
stuff comes in contact with the pericystic fluid, it causes a chemical mastitis. So fat is very inflammatory. Uh, and it, it, it's actually the fat created by the apocrine cells that create the inflammation. And it's common. You will see many episodes in a year. But it, it, you know, when we look at it from the imaging, I can't tell if this is just chemical mastitis or an infected cyst. The only way I can tell is to aspirate the pus and send it for gram stain culture. And what I didn't mention is that most of these that occur outside the hospital are caused by staphylococcus. And so what I do is I put them on a 72-hour prescription of, of dicloxacillin uh, when I aspirate them. And then about nine out of 10 of them are not infected. Nine out of 10 are just chemical mastitis. So when I get the 72 hour culture back and it's negative, then I haven't, you know, I haven't given them seven or 10 days of antibiotics. I've only given them three days. If she's one of the 10 who is infected, then I may have to extend her prescription for another seven days. But I'm, I'm pretty active with using dicloxacillin in these patients. When I get pus, I put them on diclox for 72 hours till I get the culture. Oops, I think you're uh, muted. I can't hear you. Uh, we have one more question. It says, can you explain needle manipulation? Uh, can I explain what? Needle manipulation. Needle manipulation, okay. All right, so um, let's say that my pen is my needle and, and this is a cyst. So, I put my needle into the center of the cyst and I can't drain any fluid, okay? So I have three possibilities. Possibility number one is that it is fluid, that it's too viscous to come through the size of the needle. So one thing I could try is to go to a larger needle. If I normally use a 20 gauge, I could go to an 18 gauge. Possibility number two is that it is a cyst, but it's filled with apical metaplasia. Now remember, apical metaplasia is attached all along the walls of the cyst, so it's not going to aspirate. But apical metaplasia is very weak. It's thin. It's gracile. So what, it, it's not going to prevent me from rocking my needle. So I can take my needle and rock the tip up, and I can rock the tip back. And if I can move the needle back and forth through the cyst, I can break some of these apocrine cells loose. And then I can smear them on a slide. And so even though my aspiration failed, and even though I would normally prefer to do a core biopsy, I can save the procedure by getting apocrine snouts and proving it's just apocrine metaplasia. If, on the other hand, this is a papilloma, or fibroadenoma, when I try to rock the needle in the, in the, inside the cyst, it's fixed. So when I try to push the tip of the needle down, the whole nodule moves. When I try to move the tip of the needle up, the whole lesion moves up with the needle. So I can't move the needle within the lesion, it stays fixed within the lesion. So that's how I can solve the three possibilities uh, that exist when I fail to aspirate a cyst. Uh, we have a question from Rawan al -Assaf. It says, if a cyst aspirated completely, it doesn't need a core biopsy always. Right. Complete aspiration, bi reds too, I stop. And I usually throw the fluid away. You know, I'm not going to send that for cytology and flow cytometry. If I think it's a benign cyst and it aspirates completely, to me, that's concordant, and I don't need to send it for uh, fluid cytology. I'll throw it away. Uh, what is I don't, don't okay. aspirate. I don't aspirate a lot of cysts 
mostly when I ask Brad assist, it's because she's been scheduled for a core biopsy and I want to cancel the core biopsy. <laughs> okay. Uh, what if cystic legion has internal flow but no definite solid component? Do we need to do biopsy? And what if MRI done and showed by rat two cyst? How to explain the blood flow in the ultrasound? Uh, are we talking? Was the question, what do I do if there's internal flow and it's a cyst? Yeah, what if cystic legion has internal flow? All right. So if there is internal flow in a non simple cyst, it's Byred's 4A. And I want to do ultrasound guided DVAB, directional vacuum assisted biopsy. I don't want a core biopsy. And I don't want to try to avoid the vascular stalk. I want to make, I want to find out where does that stalk come into the wall? You know, what's going on inside is important. What's most important is where the vessel comes through the wall because that lesion is not attached at any other point if it's benign. I mean, if it's a cancer, it might have multiple points of attachment. But if it's a benign papilloma, it's just it's only attached right where that vessel comes through the wall. So I don't want to avoid that vessel. I want to target that vessel with my vacuum biopsy because I will get the whole lesion on the first specimen if I get its vascular stalk. That's why papillomas so often can infarct. I mean. If you have a papilloma and it has a single vascular stalk, it's easy for it to rotate. When it rotates, that's how it infarcts spontaneously. But it, you know, it makes sense that when you're, and it's the same for intraductal papillary lesions. We didn't talk about intraductal papillary lesions, but you can think of a duct as a smaller cyst, or you can think of a cyst as a larger duct. So when it, whether I'm doing vacuum biopsy of intraductal papillomas or intracystic papillary lesions, I specifically target the vascular stalk. Now, does that cause more bruising? Absolutely. Papillary lesions are vascular, number one. Number two, they tend to be closer to the nipple, so there's just more vascularity in the area. But I do specifically want to target the vessel because it's, you know all the benign lesions are only attached at that one point. And I can, get it, I can get the whole thing in the first specimen almost every time if I target where the vessel penetrates through the wall. I just have to inform the patient, hey, you're likely to get some bruising, but it's the right thing for us to do. And also, don't be afraid to use a lot of epinephrine with your lidocaine, even near the skin. I don't worry about necrosing the skin. My surgeon's never worried about it. I never had a case of that happen. Uh, so it, it definitely, if you're going to vacuum, biopsy, papillary lesions, don't be afraid to use epinephrine in your uh, lidocaine. We have a question from Russell Muayyad. It says, what pyrats given to clustered microcysts and uh, because it's getting better, so in this case, should we give it pyrat three? If, if you're doing a screening ultrasound and you see multiple asymptomatic, non-mammographically visible clustered microcysts, the pyrats two by rural multiplicity. If you have a mammographically visible or palpable clustered microcysts and they are simple, they're pyrids too. On the other hand, if they're palpable or mammographically visible and they're complex cystic and solid clustered microcysts, then they're pyrids three or four A. So basically, if I see internal vascularity, it's four A. If I don't see internal vascularity, it's pyrids three, but I would biopsy pyrids three or four. Okay. Uh, how much? Lab. Okay. How much epinephrine to lidocaine? Pardon me. How much epinephrine to lidocaine? Uh, you know, I don't know. We just it, we, it comes, you know, it just comes mixed. So you can either use lidocaine without epinephrine or lidocaine with epinephrine. But I don't know what the mixture is. It's just uh, it's how we buy it. When we're working very close to the skin, you know, if I'm gonna, like in a papillary lesion that's right under the skin. So, um, you know, I could put a 25 gauge spinal needle in with a connecting tube 
and I can hydrodissect the skin up away. So when I do vacuum biopsy, I don't pull the skin down and accidentally biopsy it. For that hydrodissection, I will use lidocaine without epinephrine. But when I'm biopsying a papillary lesion and my needle is coming in deep to the lesion, everything deep and on the sides, I use epinephrine on because that's where the blood vessels are. Okay. If vascularity is not seen in the solid part of a cyst, can it be reassuring? Well, again, that's where I use the uh, imaging features. I can't tell anything from the solid components that are up against fluid. The only place that I can discriminate papillary apical metaplasia from a papilloma or carcinoma is where it appears to be attached. So I'm looking for absence of the capsule, a duct extension, keyhole shape, or enlarged ducts in the surrounding tissue, or, or irregularity. You know, so basically, I'm evaluating just the point where it's attached, and then the vascular thought. Uh, but I, I, I have imaging features that we talked about. And again, I'll, I'll go back to that slide and, and show it one more time, just to point it out one more time what I'm, what I'm talking about. Yeah. So basically, I can't tell anything from this red part that's surrounded by fluid. I have to look specifically where it's attached to the wall. And I have to look for absence of the capsule and irregularity or duct extension outside the cyst, just, just along this surface where it appears to be attached to the wall. OK. We have one more question. If we face uh, ultrasound typical picture of papilloma, give by rods. And what do you prefer to do, biopsy or send for exogenal biopsy? Ask one more time, please. I don't think yeah, I caught sure. the entire question. Yeah, if, if we face uh, ultrasound typical picture of papil uh, papilloma, give by rods. What do you prefer to do, biopsy or send for exogenal biopsy? I prefer to do the biopsy myself but I would never do a biopsy, I would only do vacuum. If you don't have a vacuum device, uh, I'd probably need a locate for the surgeon. <laughs> I don't think core biopsy is the right thing to do. And this is a problem because in most countries, the stupid government won't pay for vacuum biopsy, but there are certain cases where you absolutely must have a vacuum biopsy. In intraductal papillomas and intracystic papillary lesions absolutely require vacuum. Any government that doesn't pay for it is wrong, but you know, it's the way the, it's the way that the world works. If you can't do vacuum biopsy, then you probably should send it to surgery because core is not the right thing to do. Okay. Uh, how to differentiate between intraductal solid lesions, VS intraductal depress or inspecated discretion if no internal color flow? Um, you know, that's a very complicated subject. <laughs> I, I have an entire talk on introductory papillary lesions and nipple discharge. Um, and it turns out that about 95% of the lesions causing nipple discharge are benign. Only about 5% are malignant. And I do have ways of distinguishing. Um, but I, I don't think we have time to talk about it. It's, it's not that simple. Yeah. And, you know, it requires a complete discussion. And I have a complete talk on that, but I'm happy to give any time. But I don't think I can answer that quickly. OK. Uh, this question will be the last question that we can take. So please, if you have any question, you can email, uh, send it by email, and we will forward it, forward it to Dr. Tom. Um, Dr. Tom, the last question. Any particular instructions while dealing with bilateral multiple complex cysts like papilloma, papilloma amatosis? Whoa, yes. Um, that's one, I mean, if, if it's a screening exam and they're all under a centimeter, which is by reds too, by virtue of multiplicity, 
but it sounds to me like if it's papillomatosis, some of them are palpable, some may be mammographically visible. There, what I do is I try to find the largest and or most suspicious on each side, and I do a vacuum on that, and then I assume that all the others are the same if it turns out to be benign. Okay. So, so basically, I look for the most suspicious lesion and try to biopsy it. And then, then you know, I mean, I'm not going to try to do 10 biopsies in each side. I'm going to try to just biopsy the most suspicious lesion on each side. Thank you so much, Dr. Tom, for this great session. And we hope to see you again later on. Okay. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow we will have the last session of the series and will be about the 3D mammography in the screening and diagnostic settings by Dr. Pam Otto. We will, we will start at 6 p.m. Jordan time as usual. I want to remind all of you that you need to attend all the sessions to get the certification. You can reach out to us through GBCP Facebook page or through the official emails. Thank you so much for your participation and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.